Hi guys, well welcome back to Kit Car and Direct and MK Sports Cars. Well this video is a little bit different. We done one a couple of years ago which was to do with IVA. So we thought we'd do a little refresher one on it. On a vehicle we've had in now that we've put onto the ramp to give you guys sort of an idea on the top sort of 40, 50, maybe even 60 top tips about some of the guidelines. Now you can download on the internet, we can probably put you a link, the M1 manual, which is all the guides between this. And I'm sure your manufacturer, as we do, in the build manual will help you every step of the way along the journey to get your car road registered. Right, so we'll kick off here at the front end of the vehicle, and then we'll move through to the engine bay, into the cockpit, to the rear of the car, and we'll even probably do underneath. So let's start here with some of the areas um, that you'll be looking at. The immediate thing is, depending on your manufacturer, here at MK Sports Cars, we do a lot of the hard work for you, i.e. we make headlight brackets that comply. We make indicator pods, we make front wings and front wing stays and grille meshes that all comply. But I will talk you through them if you're building maybe your home build, your Hanes or your low cost etc as well. So dimension wise you're going to need one of these guys, a little handy tool, a little tape measure here for some measurements. Now indicators and headlights have a specific measurement which is height from the floor and height from the side of the vehicle. And the minimum height on a front headlight has to be 500. Now we are, that's 500 here, so we're well above that, we're 580, but it's 500 from the floor. Indicator is the same, but that sets out at 350 millimetres, which is down there. So as you can see, this well complies within that radius here. Now these two components, while we're here, we'll talk about those, they have to be set at a certain beam height, which the testers have on the station. Now you can try and line this up in your garage wall, a lot of these um, IVA centres are very, very helpful and they probably will let you tweak that on the day, but if not, you can set that out. If you've got a garage door or wall, you can set that height. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is this little indicator here. This has to be visible at 45 degrees from this way and 80 degrees from here. So if I'm here and we go 90 and I go back 10 degrees, which is here, and then from the alignment of here, we pace out, we pull out here, you need to be five degrees angled down. So from here, if I take it here, I'm in line with it, five degrees down, can I see that indicator? Well, yes I can on this particular instance. Now, on this side, cooking from this angle, you need to be at 45 degrees from the vehicle, looking down and looking at five degrees from the light and make sure you can see that indicator just there. And on this occasion, you can on both. But a lot of the vehicles already have them fitted at the front here. We've Now we can do both, we can have them here or here. But if it's fitted here, you always comply. If it fits this angle, you just gotta make sure that they meet the compliance. Next thing, nut covers. Sharp edges, guys. This is all of this area here. So what they have is a big sphere, it's a 100 mil sphere. If you make a fist though, it's a really good indication that anything you touch needs to have a 2.5 mil radius. Now this bolt here, I'm hitting it and I can actually touch this. So I know that I've got to make another cover on this particular vehicle to put over that to make sure that that complies. This one here has already got the cover. These have already got the covers. And things like here where we're going to do the tracking, you've got a little rubber cover that will also slot over the bolt that makes it comply. And any sharp edges that you can touch with your hand or your fist in that area, he's going to make sure they've got a 2.5 mil radius. So the only one on this one to do is this area here we need to address just to make sure because I can touch that doesn't have quite the radius on this section here so we'll put a nut cover to cover that one here and that comes on this side of the vehicle or on this side of the vehicle it makes no difference make sure any sharp edges this one again is going to not comply in that section here in here doesn't matter you're not in here you can't get into there on the disc and that etc you can't get in and touch anything on here with it and the wing stay does add some protection as well next job front grille now this little mesh panel 
also has to comply with a 2.5 meter rad millimeter radius as well. So in here, the maximum width you can hide generally of it is generally around about 10 to 12 mil, if I remember rightly, with a height on it, so that when they have that as an impact zone, believe it or not, it will comply. There is a specific measurement, so make sure if you're buying really big gap grills, you probably won't comply. It's got to be quite a finish mesh on there. Um, we sell them, and we do sell them as a bolt-on kit as an IVA if you ain't using the, the standard grill mesh there as well. So while we're into the radius test at the front of the vehicle, certain things, if you didn't have this rubber edge trim on the wing, this would be classed as a sharp edge. So we put a rubber trim on the vehicle here. This has just come off there. On this to make sure that that complies. And while we're in with the indicators as for this one, this particular indicator here is on the side of the vehicle. Now, why is it in the front wing here? I probably hear you ask. Well, it's to comply with, if I'm at the back of the vehicle here and I come out and I look from again from the vehicle edge, five degrees out that I must be able to see that from a said distance from the corner. So if I was to turn that on and put that indicator on, I can now see that indicator quite clearly. In fact, I can come right the way out. You can see that indicator quite visibly. You can't put them in this particular part of the panel in the scuttle because if you actually come out five degrees and then come down low enough to the line, you would actually impede. You won't be able to see that from this angle. So that's why we put them in front wing. That then complies with the regulation set out in the M1 manual. Now, while we're here, bonnet scoop edge, this particular bonnet scoop is sunk back. So it doesn't actually need any trimming there because I can't actually get my fist in there to check that as long as this front edge, if your bonnet scoop's different, this front edge has to be a 2.5 mil radius. You may have a flat bonnet. Even things like uh, Caterham's have the little louvers in them, in metal louvers, they would have to be covered up with a rubber trim because they actually would be classed as a sharp edge. So things like that, just checking those to make sure there's no sharp edges on any scoops. And while you're around there, your bonnet clutches will also be part of it. Now these particular ones, they're a metal one as you can see, they don't comply as standard because they're classed as a sharp edge, but we do actually do a rubber cover boot that slots over this particular one. We sell them in a pack of four, that slot over and then that makes that vehicle uh, compliant. Or we do sell a rubber one that's already done as well, but you've got to make sure your bonnet catches have got compliance of the 2.5 mil radius. Last area to look at if you've got any wiring guys. So you've got wiring coming in from the indicators, from the headlights, etc. You've got to make sure that this is nice and secure. Within every 300 millimetres maximum, we tend to go every 200 millimetres, making sure it's cable tied and in some kind of sheafing um, to make sure that there's no abrasion on the cables. A, that's compliance, but of course, that's also a safety thing for your vehicle as well. So any wiring, this is run up in a conduit here in through and out and this one's been also done cable tied in place that should be actually fine no loose wires to fall about etc and also the braided lines that are in here when you're turning the steering lock to lock this particular braided hose is a flexible one turning the steering full lock left and right you have to make sure that that does not interfere with any part of the chassis in any way shape or form so if you go full left and then full right to make sure it doesn't interfere with any part of the chassis. This one's made a pig's tail onto it, which is fine. Um, you can make it whatever length you want. Um, but this one, as long as it doesn't touch or interfere with any part of the chassis, because obviously it's a IVA compliance, but it's also a safety factor. You won't want your brake line wearing out and causing brake failure at any particular time. Right guys, what we do is we'll pop the bonnet off. Have a look at the engine bay, because there's uh, several areas that come under compliance as well. Right. First thing, obviously they're going to look for making sure it's nice and presentable in here. It doesn't have to be, but making it look presentable, obviously you can spot any areas, see if there's any leaks, see if there's any loose cabling or anything that's going to cause um, damage to the vehicle in any way. So we've got at least more about of a safety and compliance thing more than anything. So let's get into wiring first. Wiring needs to be neat and tidy. Either in a conduit, it cannot have bare wires out of there. It's all right having a small towel, but most of it's all in conduit. And this has to be secured in location and again meeting and trying where you can within the 300 millimeters so we've got wiring here and then rest of it is all here and in conduit tucked nice and neat this particular customer has tucked it nice and neat under here in conduit all the way through so it's all out the way it's all protected from the elements and for many abrasions as well next thing we're going to talk about fuel lines now on the high booster engine we've got one 
fuel line on the particular vehicle, but on some vehicles you may have two fuel lines that's coming out. This is a fuel line here on this particular one. We've covered it in or customer ads because we supply it. We've covered it in a conduit because it's a rubber line, but under here they may ask you to inspect that to make sure it is a fuel line that's compliant and it says it's fuel safe on it. Um, and then making sure that this is in a conduit, we run it all the way through, A, it's protection, B, it's safety. And again, this has to be within 300 millimeters minimum securing points. Again, I would stick under that, try and keep to the 200 millimeters where possible. Right, then you've just got to check everything else that's secure, making sure it's secure within the vehicle. Now we've got some hoses, obviously coolant lines and things like that that are running about, that are moving about, could cause harm. Well, we've got, just spotted this one here, for example. We have this here. Um, this is a coolant line. Um, you wouldn't really want this flopping about, so we'll make sure that's secure in some way for the customer to make it either compliant. Um, again, you just don't want that. That could then abrase on the chassis, which will then cover it probably cost you a fuel leak or oil leak or water leak if you didn't have these in line. Second thing while we're under here is chassis. Now the vehicle must be stamped with a chassis. We've got a chassis plate and a chassis number. Here's the plate. It must be on the driver's side of the vehicle off the centre line. So this is the centre line of the vehicle. So it must be within this area um, on the bulkhead for the chassis plate. Chassis plate just requires the manufacturer's name and the chassis number. doesn't require anything else other than that. And also the chassis needs to be stamped with the appropriate matching number somewhere on the chassis, again off a centre line on the driver's vehicle. If it's a left-hand drive, it would be on this side, if it's a right-hand drive, it's on here. As is down here, we laser match all our chassis anyway. The chassis number is down here um, on every single chassis. So if you're looking for a used vehicle from anything from 2016 onwards, every single one is etched into the chassis from, from this part section here. Next area, steering. While we're in here, we've got a steering shaft and a steering column that's connected to your steering wheel. What they will do is making sure that when you're turning the steering, nothing on the front of the vehicle or in the steering column is touching or wearing or being abrasive in any way and that it's nice and free moving. Secondly is, while we're in the steering column area, this section here needs to be a collapsible column. So any event of any impact, this particular column is a collapsible one. It's got a spline shaft here. This would then force up and all the bar would rise up into here. And while you're coming up into here, in the cockpit area, it's designed also, we have this. This is a collapsible steering boss. So in the event of an impact, this would actually collapse forward as well. You need those two areas for safety and implication, and it will be tested at the IVA centre. And I've just spotted, for example, here we have, uh, which will secure, not a problem, but give you an example, we have a steering column that's actually touching the accelerator cable, as you can see there. So we will fix that. We've not tested this or checked this vehicle over yet, but just to give you a prime example of some of the areas that need to be checked. Right guys, we're going to talk about brakes and the master cylinders and the pot areas now. So the brake lines are in the vehicle, front to back. These need to be secured again. It's hard to see in here guys, and apologies, but in here, these need to be secured with every 300 millimeters. Again, as I said pattern there, we go less, as we said, every 200. This has got a full braided system. You can use a copper or copper nickel, or copper or whatever they call it, etc. as well. You can use either, but making sure that none of these lines are touching, this one here is example, none of them are touching or can touch anything that's metal, in any way. So we will secure that out of the way for the customer, not a problem. We'll put an extra clip in here to bring that away. And also then checking your brake system for any leaks, pressing the brake pedal, making sure there's no leaks in it in your system. Obviously it's a safety. The pots that are in here that hold the fluid need to have a low level warning light on them that's secured somewhere on your dashboard to inform you if the pots are low. These have got two little floats in them. And also we need a sticker, which is not on here, that is a little dot four. It's not on this particular one, but it needs to show a little dot four sticker to show that that particular fluid in there is correct. Um, this one hasn't got it on, um, but we sell those as little dot four stickers. As again, we've not checked this vehicle over, and there's making sure, which I can see just down in here, there's no leaks. That's just a leak out the lid, I think, on this particular one. But again, just checking the pots, making sure there's no leaks in any way, shape, or form, and uh, making sure it's all secure, tidy, all the brake lines are uh, clean, clear of any mechanical structures. 
Right guys, now the obvious thing is obviously you're going to start your engine for the first time at some point is to make sure that there's no leaks, oil leaks, coolant leaks, etc. And when you do do your IVA tests, you've got to make sure that you've got to get the engine up to at least 85 degrees temperature. That's the minimum uh, set in the manual for your emissions. So when you're doing the emissions, they will ask you to set that between two and a half and 2,850, I think it is RPM. And then they'll check your emissions. Now, I could go into emissions, but it does depend on your vehicle, what engine is, what engine age, etc. So there's lots of different things to go through. And that's a bit more complicated the for example, if it's a pre-catalytic converter engine, pre-1992, then it's a different emissions test than it is for a later emissions one like these Hayabusa engines, which have different parameters on the CO2, hydrocarbons and lambda. Obviously, you need to refer to your manufacturer or your supplier of your engine if you have any concerns about that, and then they can guide you on where it sits in its parameters for its year of manufacture. Right, so we've done the front, we've done the middle part of it, and now we're going to start onto the interior. Well. If your manufacturer, a bit like us, supplies some of these parts, it does make your life a lot easier because a lot of the hard work is done. But if it's not and you're doing your home build, like we said earlier, then these are some of the elements that may work for you. Now, talk about steering earlier. Steering boss needs to be collapsible, um, or the steering, at least what it's linked into, in some way needs to be collapsible at the front here. Obviously, you've got to make sure you've got all your operating devices here. For example, uh, you've got your indicators, you must have a warning lights for all the operation of all of your lights, etc. So if the lights comes on, then you see an illuminated light switch. If we have a high beam come on, I need to see an illuminated light switch. If we have the hazard light come on, we need to see an illuminated light switch. If I turn the ignition off with the hazards, that must still work. So without the key in the ignition, the hazard lights still must operate. So that's something here. If you've got a battery kill switch, the hazard lights still have to operate. Um, outside of all the ignition and power being turned off the vehicle. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk through the lights process. So the lights on this one, have, they've got warning signs saying what they are. So we've got side lights here and then dip beam. And then we've got high beam and the warning light comes up for us. Thank you very much. And then we have a fog light. Put the fog light on. Okay, fog lights on. Yeah. And then we go back to side lights. Fog lights off. Go back to dip beam. The fog light should stay off and then have to be out turned on again separately, like so. Okay, then on here we've got a reverse light. Because this is a bike engine, it has two ways of reversing. We have a reverse light, then we have a reverse motor, which you'll have to have compliance with. Um, so if you've got a bike engine, you have to have a form of reversing a vehicle. And a reverse light that um, has to have a warning light to show that it's on. You can't just have it so as a separate switch. You have to show that this light is illuminated. So when you're driving down the road, you know your reverse light is on. And this is labelled accordingly. Right. Now, while we're in the dashboard area facility, we'll talk about this. That anything from your steering wheel size here, you're going to get a tape measure, which is here. And we're going to go out 127 mil. 127 mil, guys, which is there. Which is basically at the edge of this gear lever. Anything from in this zone, then, from the 127 mil, doesn't comply with the 2.5 mil radiator test because they class that as the impact area because all of this is in the way. Anything outside of this area must comply. It mustn't have a sharp edge. So customers done a great job with this dashboard. They sort of countersunk it in and made this foam trim for all the sharp edges around the edge there. And all the switches are flush mounted. So again, they, they all comply. There's nothing here protruding outside of this area on the dashboard to say that there's a sharp edge. If you had a little toggle switch sticking out here with no covers or anything else and etc. there, then that will be a fail area. So anything within this zone, from here to here, is free. You can do what you want. You can have a little toggle switch here and it wouldn't comply, but anything outside of that zone would comply. Centre panel here. We have a gear lever, gear knob, handbrake lever. We use these padded centre tunnel tops, but if you've got just a metal trim around here, making sure again, if you had just L bracket trim that it complies with a 2.5 mil radius and you can't cover it up with just sticky foam guys, I think that's it. it has to be something permanent that you can't just peel off with tape, etc. as well. So that's the same with the steering wheel, making sure it complies and you've got things like here, which is the horn on this particular one. Right, interior wise guys, just a couple of other things to look at. Handbrake efficiency, making sure there's plenty of travel on that and it's not, you've got, um, two or three clicks left after it's uh, making its adaption. Next thing under here in the pedal box, making sure the pedal box, if it's a bias adjustable one, that it has to have lock nuts on it on either side. Our one does, 
this particular car has got them on ready to, to set them on the day, that sort of problem. And it must have a sickle labelled up under there, which this one particularly does at the bottom there as a little label that tells you about non-adjustment of the pedal box. We sell those as an IVA compliance and making sure that the surfaces are non-slip on the brake pedal. Accelerator doesn't matter, but it needs to be on a brake pedal that is a non-slip surface. Right, we're going to talk about seat belts and safety guys, that's a really important thing, it's alright having a sports car and a fun and a fast car but your safety is important. So they will check the seat belts to make sure they comply, that they click in nice and freely and that you can do it with one hand and the whole thing will come apart nice and simple, they'll check it on both sides. They will also check the label that's on here to make sure it's compliance, it's e-markings etc, they have little markings and everything if you've got new stuff that is in date and up to date we supply harnesses our own branding ones they do comply. Secondly where the harnesses come along and where they bolt in they will check that as well so where the bolts in these then uh, uh, the bolt goes through they will check that it's on there and the securing point is nice and structurally sound we do it on all our chassis it's welded in and it's welded down in this section with a little humpback bridge as well so they are very very strong but they may check the thread length ask you to remove it even on the day to see how much thread length is in the bolt there to do it this Little cover here is to cover up the sharp edges. That covers it up nicely to making sure that these little witches hat, as we call them, because it looks like a witches hat, covers up the bolt, the nut, the thread, it does everything else and neat and tidies it up and then it uh, doesn't comply, finishes it off nice and neat and tidy. Talking about safety of harnesses, we're going to talk about security more than anything now. Security is this, you need two forms of immobilisation on your vehicle. You can do it in a couple of different ways. This one has a standard Mazda column at the top here. So we have an immobiliser built into the key. That's on this particular one. It has a separate immobiliser, which is fine. And also it has a steering lock as well. So it's actually got three. And so it's got a key, which is one. Number two, it's got a steering lock. So that's on. And obviously it's got an immobiliser as well. So that's three forms on this particular one. But you only need two. So if you didn't have a steering lock, as long as you have a key, and maybe an immobiliser so the vehicle can't start, that is fine. But two forms of immobilisation, even. Key on this one and, oh, will it come on? Yeah, steering lock. Got to talk about seats now, guys. Seats have to be nice and structurally so sound and strong, guys. Um, now, these are on particular ones are on seat runners, which is fine. Makes life easier for you as a driver and as them as a tester. Now, if your seats are on a runner, um, then the headrest needs to come with it. So if you have got a separate seat that sits here and a headrest may be bolted to the roll cage, that if you move the seat, the headrest is not coming in, that will be a foul. So the headrest has to come with it. If you have a headrest mounted to here and you have a seat, then I suggest you just bolt your seat in a fixed position so it can't be moved. Next thing is any edges or trim if there are sharp edges on the seat, this has got nice rubber trimming around it here and in this section you may have a padded seat. This is all compliance and stops abrasions on the seat belts and wear and tear and of course sharp edges for you in case of an impact. Now we're talking about sharp edges, any body panels that are here, we do another trim that goes over here which we'll sort out but this particular one would foul at this moment in time because it's got a sharp edge here, you can hear that probably, um, that would foul. We'll sort that though. And then underneath here, um, we have to make sure there's two areas to look at. Number one is this dashboard radius. If it's a hard surface, then it has to make sure it has a 19mm radius and our dashboards do comply. You can do a padded dashboard, then it complies with a different radius edge as well. Under here, we've got to make sure that there's nothing sharp or that's going to impact you in any way as a passenger on an impact or as a driver on both sides. So if there's anything here that doesn't comply with a 2.5mm radius, if you've got a bolt or a nut sticking out, make sure it has a nut cover on it and this particular one here has got one for example there's got a little nut under here Lewis can't zoom in but it's got a nut protruding out for an earth point and that needs a little cover on it and we'll sort the same one out. Same with compliant exhaust system any sharp edges making sure your towel pipe in this area has got a radius and a bead radius and no sharp edges protruding no sharp edges no sharp edges this particular one we'll have to do something with so this Lambert sensor bulb that would actually foul at this moment in time. Same as these Jubilee clips, they would foul because they're in an impact area, I can touch them and they're sharp. So we will actually change these anyway. They're the wrong clamps. We'll change them to Bicolors and make sure they were on the inside on both and this will be covered up so that it cannot be impacted for the 2.5 mil radius test. 
Okay guys, so when you're building your car, um, you may not have the privilege of having a ramp like we do here, but as you're building it, take note maybe of some areas to look at. So we're under the car, I've got the trusty torch out, I'm gonna have a look, making sure that there's prop shafts in here, making sure there's no interference, no brake lines, no fuel lines, no electrics, they're all tidied up out of the way. The examiner will look under here and they will look for any serious fuel leaks, oil leaks, cables, brake lines, oil lines, anything not actually being tied down or secured to make sure it's structurally sound and safe under the vehicle. They will also perform a couple of other tests for sump heights for the center height of the vehicle. But, you know, make sure are the wheels free moving, you know, is there brakes binding, etc. It's a little bit on that particular one, it may be a reason, but make sure everything's free moving. And then we make our way up, making sure the prop shaft is not interfering with anything here. This particular vehicle has got a, as I said, electric reverse motor on it. Well, it has a live terminal here. You have to make sure that live terminal is covered up with a little, this particular one, it's got it on there, a nice little terminal cover to make sure. Making sure the seat belts, uh, sorry, seats, beg your pardon, are bolted in nicely. Nice large washers, making it structurally sound. Ours go through two bars as well. So that's nicely done, nice, neat, tidy job as well. Moving on to the rear of the vehicle, under here, braided brake lines. I can see a problem here on this particular one. You've got to make sure that these do not foul in any way, shape or form. Uh, we're going to have to fix this because this is fouling the wheel a little bit on this section, so it needs to be tidied up out of the way. Making sure that nothing interferes with the wheel and rotation or when the vehicle is moving up and down. If you've got any cables that run through body panels, they must have a rubber grommet. They cannot be um, cables rubbing through a body panel in any way, shape or form, or abrasive. Making sure that the lines are all clear, the fuel lines when they run through are nice and secure. Again, every 300 millimeters maximum for your fuel lines and brake lines and the whole rear of the vehicle. Making sure that the fuel tank is se secure in some way or form, making sure it's strapped or bolted down and it must have an earth strap. So you must make sure this fuel tank is earthed in some way to the chassis. It can be done via small cable, little black cable, little green cable, either one, to show that it's a negative earth. They will look out for that or may ask you to provide evidence on the day. Making sure that everything is clean, tidy, bolted, maybe putting marks on all your bolts to make sure it's all secure in every way and that nothing, and again, no leaks, no movement or in any way, shape or form. Now, obviously we can get into brakes and brake testing efficiencies, that's a different thing on the day, but making sure all your handbrake cables are operational and adjustability is there on the day in case you need to tweak that for yourselves to make sure that it complies with the percentages required. Right guys, on the rear to the vehicle, we've dropped it off the ramp now, we're gonna talk about lights and locations. Again, the trusty tape measure comes in handy here. Two things need to make sure that this has a reflector in here. If you don't have a light that has them, then you'd have to have a separate location. That has also a requirement on a minimum height of 250 millimeters, maximum of 900 millimeters, and 400 mil from the edge. So, we've got to make sure we're within 400 mil, 400 mil from the edge of the vehicle is fine. 250 millimeters maximum height, so that would be down here, and a maximum of 900, so we're all the way up here. So this complies. This then moves on to your lights, tail lights and everything else. These need to be within 350 millimeters. We're at 500 pretty much on there. And again, 400 for the minimum of the width. 400's here, so that's in. And a maximum height of 1500 actually. So you can have your vehicle from anywhere, from there up to there, if it will fit. So from 350 to 1500. That's on your rear tail light. And these particular ones have got the reverse light, the side light, the brake light, and the indicator built in with a reflector, and they are IVA compatible. We move on to the fog light. The fog light has to be on the center of the vehicle or inset from uh, anywhere inside the vehicle uh, of this particular area. So, and it has a minimum height of 250 millimeters, which is down there, and a maximum height of one meter. Now this particular one comes in at about 980. We've tried this before, we know this works. We set that within this area. It's on the center line of the vehicle. Um, it doesn't have any 
width restriction here as long as it's in from the centre line to the outside of the vehicle on this plane it's not a problem. The reverse light doesn't have a dimension so it can sit anywhere which is why we put them in to our little cell tower lights there. The uh, number plate light is set in a position, we put it here and as long as it's in a position where you can fix a full number plate here so if you imagine a rectangular number plate sits in We've got plenty of space and that sinks into that criteria and the minimum height on that I think is something like 250 millimetres which is fine we're at 300 so that all complies in every way so nice and clean nice and tidy. While we're there on the rear of the vehicle we'll talk about fuel caps. Now fuel caps two forms this is a fuel cap that's opened here if you take it out and you can take the key straight out which you can't on this particular one then you would need to have a tether kit. So if I put this in now and I lock it, it's not a problem, etc. But if I take this out, put it out, I can't take the key out, that actually complies because I can't take it off without doing the twist on it, etc. But if I can, then I must have a tether to this so that this cannot lose your fuel cap. We do sell those little kits as well, it's only a simple little tether kit, but just one of the compliances that required keys back in there and while we're there the fuel filler neck cap that goes to the fuel tank I can't share that because you've got a boot box in this particular one but making sure that that is fuel safe as well. While we finish off the rear of the vehicles a couple of things it must do is making sure that the radius of the arch covers a 30 degree angle that sits out they have a tester for that making sure it's covering if you're down here anyway it's not a compliance because you're in almost at 90 degrees and making sure that the wheel and tyre is inside of the wheel arch that's on the front and the rear making sure that both of these do comply with a 30 degree angle test which will be about here and making sure that the tyre again is under the radius. While we're down here at the tyres looking at those they will check the speed rate in the tyre is actually compatible with the speed you put down on your paperwork for the vehicle so all of these will have a G, H, V etc rating which is a speed rating written on the tyre there you can google that online or your manufacturer will tell you if that's compatible if you know what the top speed or theoretical top speed of your vehicle is despite it obviously being a 70 mile an hour speed limit the tyre has to be compatible for the speed limit of the vehicle. Right we're going to talk about noise now guys we talked about emissions in the engine etc as well so you've got a big old silencer on this particular one the maximum uh, limit on this is 99 decibels and that's at three quarters of the RPM of the maximum torque or power of your vehicle should we say so on this particular case although the booster does rev up to um, like 11,000 rpm the maximum power it makes is something like 9,200 rpm so then it's three quarters of that so it'll be tested in a region around six and a half thousand rpm so you've got to make sure that that complies with the maximum power for your particular designated engine so if you've got a car engine it'll probably be somewhere around about four to four and a half thousand depending where your peak power is made so making sure that you comply with three quarters of maximum power of your vehicle at 3 quarters RPM and nine, 99 decibels. Now while we're talking about noise and we're talking about testing, we're talking about speed, we've got to make sure that the speedo is calibrated for the tyre, the vehicle etc. They do do a test on a day. These bike engine cars we have a little calibration box in them but most if you're doing like a single donor vehicle, the Mazda one and using the Mazda everything instrumentation it will probably comply anyway but if you're doing after gauge make sure that's programmed. If you have concerns you may have to take this to a public hire but private area and, and test it up to 70 mile an hour with a GPS. GPS is not allowed, it needs to be a physical form of direct drive from a gearbox or wheel or circumference in, in some way, shape or form. So no GPS unfortunately is allowed for speedos. So if you do manage to find that private, a private road where you can test it, you may want to test your brakes um, to make sure that they are bedded in a little bit ready for testing. Um, you are allowed to drive the vehicle to and from the test centre if you're insured and you've booked your IVA test, making sure that I may be on the front and the rear of the vehicle you clearly state you're going for an IVA test in case the police do see you not registered on the road but you are allowed to do that once you are designated um, your booking uh, allocated slot. Now testing the brakes so it's a really good idea to make sure you test them because you make sure that the front wheels do lock up before the rear wheels that's the most important factor 
because obviously if there is lock up first you'll probably be out of control but also that would be a foul they may be allowed to be adjusted on the day but maybe if private highway or if you're driving your vehicle to your test centre make sure you test the brakes amply get them bedded in so that the fronts do lock up before the rears Right guys, that's our summary of MK Sports Cars and top tips for getting your vehicle through the IVA. I hope you enjoyed the video and I really do hope it helps you get your vehicle that you've been building on the road. If you've got any questions on this, you can put them down below and we'll try and respond. If you're building an MK already or you want to get involved with an MK in one shape, shape or form, then hook us up, phone call, email, come and see us at the factory and we can talk you through the process and you can be driving one of these amazing cars this summer.